Number one is a toxic boss. Now, what we're talking about are nine things to watch out for that may indicate that uh, your tenure of employment at this particular place wherever you work may be coming to an end. It may be very short-lived. Now, these aren't, these aren't uh, absolutes. Could be that uh, you could misread some signs, or maybe the signs are there, but uh, they don't necessarily indicate what they indicated to me. But nonetheless, we're going to go through these nine things because I think maybe they may help you a little bit. And number one is a toxic boss. These are, again, based on my life experiences, so let me tell you the experience. I was probably, I don't know, 25, 26 years old, and I took a job at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Not the best job in the world, but I was thinking, well, number one, I need a job. Number two, the owner was willing to hire me. And number three, I had my eyes set on being self-employed, owning my own business in the future. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity to learn something about business. And I did. I mean, I kept the job for two weeks, but I learned more about business in those two weeks than I probably would have learned had I spent four years studying business in college. Walked in the door, first day. There was this middle-aged woman who was the manager of the store. The owner didn't manage the store. He had hired this woman to manage the store for him. And she gave me that look, you know, like, um, like a demon, like a bat out of hell, like a jack-o'-lantern at uh, Halloween time. This was a look of hatred. It was a look of a psychopath. It was a look of a narcissist. It was a look that said, I don't like you. But I didn't pick up on it because, well, I'm autistic. I don't always pick up on these things, and I wish I had of, but I did pick up on it a little bit later just because of her behavior. Well, what happened was the whole time that I was there, two weeks, uh, basically it was traumatic. I mean, she was very verbally, emotionally abusive. She did not like me. I didn't know why. But it became very obvious. And there was one day I was working, and she said something about the fact that uh, my mind wasn't there. Now, those weren't her exact words, but it was kind of like, well, the impression was you seem to be in outer space. Again, not her exact words, but uh, she made it clear. Well, she was picking up on what I now know to be autism. Didn't know it then, she didn't know it then, but that's what it was. And so that job lasted two weeks. Um, that look she gave me. Uh, it, the only time I'd seen that look before was when I was, I don't know, 13 to 14 years old, you know, like 10, 12 years earlier. And my uncle took me to his farm. You know, spend a day on the farm, do some work, shoot his 22 rifle, whatever. And uh, we were walking to the barn, and on the way to the barn, we walked through that place where they keep cattle. What do you call that? You call it, uh, you call it a corral. So we were walking through the corral, and I got that look from one of the cows. That I hate you look. That jack-o'-lantern look. That um, demonic look psychopath, narcissist, and my uncle said to me, you get out of here. I mean, he was really concerned that that cow was going to charge me and do me some, well, maybe it was a bowl. I don't know. I can't tell the difference. Well, I can, but at the moment, uh, that wasn't what was on my mind. It was uh, getting out of there was on my mind. But that's the only other time in my entire life that I had seen that look, and I had to put up with that for two weeks. Now, here's how they got rid of me. I was a hard worker. I learned well. I enjoyed my work. But there was a day after about two weeks of working there that the owner came in and said, we need to have a talk. So we sat down to talk and the manager sat down with us. So there's the three of us, the owner, the manager, and me. And the owner asked me, did you memorize the menu, the menu board? You know, the one that you see when you walk up to the counter at a Kentucky Fried Chicken. I said, no, I didn't memorize that. And then he looked at the manager and he asked her, did you tell him to memorize the board? And she said, yeah. I said, she's flat out lying. She never did. And so uh, the owner said, well, in that case, um, that's reason for you to be dismissed. And uh, just like that, I was fired. They didn't have a reason to fire me. She just didn't like me. That's all there is to it. So what I learned from that is um, if you have a toxic boss, that's an indication that uh, you may be kicked out the door in short order. 
Yeah, I did learn something about that. And it is that if you want to put a person in a position of responsibility and authority, you might want to choose somebody who doesn't look like a pumpkin. Somebody who's not a psychopath, somebody who's not demonic or appears to be demonic. Just a suggestion. Number two, co-workers seem to be more distant. Now, for those of us who are autistic, and I know a lot of you people aren't, but for those of us who are autistic, when we first show up in a workplace, people are distant because we are distant, or at least I am. That's just my personality. I don't socialize well, never have. Because cognitively, neurologically, I just can't do that. I've worked on it. I'm improving, but I'm 70 years old, and uh, I'm far from being there. It's never going to happen, but okay, I'm getting better. But if those people who are already distant start getting more distant, what that is, well, it's an indicator that there's some gossip going on about you. It's kind of like that kid, you know, that shows up at school the first day because his parents moved and he's uh, walking into a social setting that's been established among the other children and they give him a hard time. But typically that kid eventually will, you know, acclimate to the social environment in that hive mind and all will be well. That happened to me once when my parents moved and I was put into a new school, but I had no problem. With, I didn't necessarily fit in, but you know, the kids were, were kind courtesy to me, or at least they weren't mean to me. So, you know, sometimes you get a pass. But in the work situation, when your coworkers are starting to become more distant, you gotta ask yourself, what's going on here? There's something, something, probably about you, and I don't mean to make you paranoid, maybe you're just uh, imagining it, but in my experience, no, nah, it was not an imagination. In fact, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And it could be because of this. Number three is typically in a workplace, there's somebody you can identify as the insider. Well, there may be more than one insider, but this is a psychophant. This is the guy or girl, or maybe there's more than one, who likes to warm up to the supervisor, uh, the manager, the owner, whoever is in charge. Now, this is a person who is climbing up the social ladder. And uh, maybe they want to be the alpha, but they understand that, well, the way to get to be the alpha is to get to be friends with the alpha. And then when the alpha leaves, maybe is promoted, maybe quits, whatever, you'll be on good terms and they'll put in a good word for you probably what they're thinking. I don't know. But if that person who is the insider starts getting distant, that's an indicator that the supervisor who is under the influence of the insider is going to start getting distant and you're going to be out of your job. Okay, so I like to work in chicken places. I had a job at uh, Church's Chicken. And there was a guy who worked there and yeah, we got along fine, except being autistic. I didn't you know, socialize well with him. I didn't talk. I came across as probably aloof and he became distant. Well, this guy just happened to be the brother-in-law of the area supervisor. And he was the insider and he decided he didn't like me and my job was over. So if that insider is becoming more and more distant, there's a chance that he's trying to influence or she's trying to influence whoever is the decision maker. You may be on your way out of a job. Number four, I call this the one guy syndrome because virtually every place I've ever been employed, there was always one guy, seemingly. I think I can think of an exception, but there was one guy who for whatever reason just flat out didn't like me. Well, that very first uh, illustration, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, the manager just didn't like me. But I've noticed there's always been that person every place I've gotten a job, with few exceptions. Um, only most occasions, it's not the manager, it's just a coworker. But still, that coworker can make your life very, very, very miserable. Why don't they like me? I don't know. Uh, probably because I'm autistic or maybe because, yeah, they're just jerks and here's the new guy. Let's give him a hard time. 
Maybe they're envious. Maybe they think that you're going to advance faster than they do. I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what these people are thinking, but what I do know is this. Being autistic, you have a disadvantage because it's very difficult to overcome that. You know, most people, they go to work, there's this guy who gives them a hard time. They are socially savvy enough to build at least some bridge with this guy, or they know how to fight with a guy. Now, when I was talking with a therapist being evaluated for autism, one of the things I asked her about when I was talking about socializing at the workplace is these people, they know how to fight each other. You know, it's part of their social dynamic. I don't know how to do that. Someone gives me a hard time, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to be given a hard time. I don't know what to do. So there's always that one guy, it seems like, and I know that there may have been one or two exceptions, but there's always one guy, and it's not just the workplace, it's any place there are people. Somebody who just doesn't like me. The one guy syndrome, maybe you've had that experience as well. Number five is this, little or no training. Why did you hire me to do a job? Well, then you train me to do the job. Now, it could be that it's not because of you, because you have autism or any other thing. It could be the, they're, they're just, uh, I don't want to say dumb, so I'll say stupid. No, I think dumb sounds better. So let's say they, they just uh, dumb. They don't know how to run a business. And uh, I recall one of my many, 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 many jobs was I worked for a short period of time at a cable company. And my assignment, among other things, was to work the front desk. You know, when you walk in the door and uh, you want to pay your bill or you want to change your service or upgrade your service or cancel your service or whatever business you have, my job, among some other people, was to take care of these customers. But, you know, they didn't train me. Now, this was like the mid-1980s. Personal computers were just coming into their own. There was a computer terminal at the uh, counter. I had no idea how to use it. And they didn't train me. Nothing. Nothing at all. So I'd ask the coworker, And guess what? They wouldn't tell me either. Why not? Don't know. I'm not a mind reader, but my guess is that's just how people work. You know, in the hive mind, in the hierarchy, they got to work their way up. And, you know, if they tell you how to run the computer, then uh, you're as smart as they are. They, they can't tolerate that. That's anathema. You know, I'm just guessing. I don't know. But if they don't train you or they give you inadequate training, there's a good case that you're going to lose that job, and it could be because you're autistic. Or it could be because, what was the word? Dumb. Could be they just don't know how to run a business. And I got to tell you, once I started my business, I had all these bad experiences to fall back on. Great experiences. Wonderful education. Didn't like it when I was going through it, but hey, that's life. Number six, this is what I call the feedback session. Now, a smart business, if they have a um, human resources department, what they will do is they will schedule intermittent reviews with employees. Maybe every year, maybe every three months, but periodically, intermittently, they will have reviews with their employee. Because if you do it just randomly, the employee doesn't know what's going on and they fear maybe they're in trouble. And they probably are. So you got to be careful when this feedback comes. Now, you don't know. It could be they want to have a feedback session with you, a conversation with you, so they can tell you what a good job you're doing. They want to give you a raise and a promotion. I mean, if they're going to give you a raise and promotion, they got to tell you, right? So maybe that's what they're doing. My experience, I didn't get a raise. I didn't get the promotion. I got negative feedback because they were putting things in place. Well, they were opening the door, getting ready to give me the boot. This was just the preparation phase. Uh, number seven is misplacement. This is kind of like no training, only instead they put you at a job intentionally, willfully, purposely that you can't do or you don't want to do. 
So misplacement, they know you don't want to work in that department, or they know you don't want to work with that person. So they put you with that person, or they put you in that department, hoping you'll get frustrated and quit. And if you don't get frustrated and quit, then they have to go to some other option, but somehow, some way, they're going to get you out the door. Because if you are autistic, you don't fit. You just don't fit. It doesn't matter how good you do. It doesn't matter how good of an attitude you have. It doesn't matter how competent you are, how much education you have. If you don't fit socially, nothing else matters. Now, an analogy just came to my mind, so I'm going to use this. A few years ago, our car was having trouble, so we said, all right, let's go buy a new car. So my wife and I drove to the dealership and went in the door and I told the salesman, I need to buy a car seat. And he looked at me kind of funny. What do you mean? I mean, we're going to buy a new car, but first we have to check the car seat because if my wife doesn't like the car seat, the way it feels, doesn't matter. No other option matters. Nothing else about the model matters. If she doesn't fit in the car seat and it's comfortable fit, then we're not going to buy the car. So first, let's make sure the seat is uh, comfortable, that she fits, you know, in the seat. So, uh, you know, nothing else matters. And that's true when you go to a workplace or any other social environment. First, before anything else, any other qualifications, doesn't matter how big the engine is, doesn't matter, you got to fit, right? You got to fit in the social setting. So the social setting is analogous to the seat in the car. Glad I thought of that off the top of my head, but uh, I'll probably use that again a few times. So, uh, misplacement. Number eight is, um, how shall we say this? Uh, let's, let's call it downturn. So, you're at the workplace, and there's a supervisor, and if you're autistic, you don't pick up on facial cues, but maybe if you're watching for it, you may see something like, the boss is giving you a dirty look. Okay, we're back to the jack-o'-lantern, right? So he may be giving you that furled brow look or looking out the side of his eye, but you could tell him or her, whatever it is, that uh, there's something going on there. So what's happening is they are taking mental notes. They're watching you, looking for you to screw up, looking for an opportunity, or they just don't like you and they're giving you that look and that's the same, same basic thing because they're going to find something. By the way, what to do about this? I was going to mention this a moment ago, but I decided to wait for this. Um, when you go to a workplace, I didn't do this, but I should have, and that is just take notes. End of the day, virtually every day, mental notes, not good enough, because you forget, at least I do. You forget the person, or the person's name, or the exact circumstances, or the date something. So if you just write it down or you know post it, uh, Put it on your computer somewhere where it won't get deleted. How'd your day go? If you had a bad day, somebody gave you a hard time, you've got the notes. Now, if you want to get a little bit deeper, and this may be um, a violation of some company policies, but carry your video camera with you. You know, if you've got a video camera that has a long battery life, you can turn it on. You can buy these little pins on Amazon.com that are actually video cameras and nobody knows, but they're, you know, they're not very good quality. They don't last very long. I bought a body cam and it lasts for, I think, 14 hours. It's just amazing. It's the type that police wear. And I bought it because I go out and walk. You know, sometimes in summertime, I like to walk at night because it's cooler. And back in August, I actually got attacked by somebody. Um, that's why I have this black eye. You know, it's been there for months. Uh, it's getting better, I think. But, uh, you know, I fortunately had the camera on when it happened. So when I called the police, called 911 and reported it, I was able to show them the images, the video of the person attacking me. And that person, for what it's worth, at this very moment, as I speak, is in jail, awaiting sentencing in February. But the point is, you got to record. you got to take notes. And if it's possible, if it doesn't violate policy, consider video or audio recording your entire day, if it's possible, or at least some encounters. Number nine, 
And this is kind of like number seven, but number nine is they are setting you up to fail. And if you pick up on that, they're just trying to get you to fail. And it's not just that they misplace you in uh, the wrong department, but it could be, as we said earlier, I think I said it earlier, they could be putting you with somebody you don't like, trying to get you to get out of the job or someplace where you can't succeed. Somehow, some way you can't succeed. Or they may be setting you up to fail by talking about you to other supervisors, you know, the higher ups. And so there's a consensus. This guy's got to go. There's a lot of ways they can set you up to fail so that you can't improve your performance. But your performance goes down. And there's so many ways that could happen. These guys can be very creative in coming up with these things. And uh, I couldn't begin to enumerate all of them number one because i can't think of all of them but number two would be here for eh, a couple years all right so those are the nine things now how do you remedy this here's here's my suggestion this is what i did and it worked very well for me i had a plan a which is getting a job but i also had a plan b which is akin to having a side hustle and i had a plan c Okay, I think I had, I think I had five or six income streams coming at once. And this is back in the mid 80s. Remember when I was working at the cable company, which didn't live very long. But at that time, I had a lawn care business, lawn mowing business. Had a few customers, not many, but, uh, you know, it helped. And I didn't charge very much. I had my little push mower, you know put it in the trunk, and I go mow people's grass, and uh, hey, it's income. Plus, I got exercise. Number two, I was a part-time pastor at the church. That didn't pay very well, but man, did I enjoy that when people were being cooperative. Number three, I had an early morning job at the grocery store, and my job was to do floors. They had this loud Honda um, circular buffer. I don't think they use those anymore, but man, that thing was loud. I guess that's why you do it in the early morning when there's no you know, customers in there. But I'd go in like four or five in the morning and I'd buff the floors. So those are three income streams I had. Mowing the grass, part-time pasture, buffing the floors. Number four, I was starting my direct mail business, which is what I wound up doing for a living. That was my career lasted uh, probably 30 years, I'm guessing. But I was just getting that started. First year, I made $25. Second year, it was a part-time income. Third year, it was a full-time income, not a lot of money, but I could live on it. And, you know, just kept growing until the internet came along, thank you, Google, and effectively put me out of business. But in addition to that, you know, I had the job at the cable company. So it's one, two, three, four, five income streams. And my wife was babysitting. So we had six income streams going at once. Now, all six of them simultaneously, that didn't last very long. But we always had something to fall back on. When one of them didn't work, the other one was still there. And we could have, you know, probably added something else. Who knows? So those are the nine things you might want to watch out for. If you're having difficulty or concerned about keeping a job, because I know People who are autistic have such a difficult time keeping employment because you just don't fit in the car seat. You just don't fit socially, and that trumps everything else. So hopefully, these things helped you. And if they did, well, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you think this video deserves it, give us a thumbs up. Share this. This really helps. If you share this on social media, you know, Twitter X or Facebook, whatever. And if you have something that uh, I missed, and I'm sure you probably do because you could think of hundreds of things, uh, you might want to share those with everyone in the comment section. Thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll see you all next time.